Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking this evening you know, to join this webinar. And this webinar will be on value creation and it is a, uh, the fifth webinar in a series of eight on trust. So my name is Zui and I'm a research manager with uh, Black Sun. And uh, Black Sun is a stakeholder communications company. And what we do is we, we help you bring your story to life whether through the annual report, whether it's through digital, whether it's through social media. And uh, we're here to help you uh, tell your value creation story. And uh, we're proud to have launched this series of eight webinars uh, in collaboration with the Working Capital. Uh, the Working Capital are a co-working space, but they are more than just that. They are also neighborhood builders and with a blend of real estate, office space, co-working and F&B. So uh, thank you, Working Capital, for this collaboration. So before I, I get into this webinar proper, just wanted to highlight the synopsis for this. What we want to, you to take away from this uh, are three key learning outcomes or three learning points. Of course, what is value and what is value creation and how do you link value to value creation? And of course, what is purpose? But more importantly, what is purpose beyond profit? And last but not least, we would like you to take away from this webinar the best practices in communicating your value creation, as well as some examples of um, value creation stories that are unique, as well as what happens when people don't take value and value creation seriously and uh, how they have gone wrong. So on this slide, you see three things, value discovery, value creation, and finally, value creation story. So you'll be very familiar with this slide because we'll be showing it throughout the presentation. Okay. And the very first thing we're going to talk about is value discovery. But before that, a very important question. What is the most valuable currency today? Now, you have attended any of our previous um, webinars. This slide will be very familiar to you because the answer to this is trust. The most valuable currency is not profits, it's not money, it's not cash, it is trust. And now more than ever in these trying times that we live in today, businesses need the trust of their stakeholders to prosper over the long term. And as earlier mentioned, you know, we are building up to the eight components of trust. In the past, we have talked about corporate culture, stakeholder engagement, business model and risk management and today we're going to talk about long-term value creation so these webinars happen every um twice a month the next one will be on purpose followed by a tone and the talk and we'll finish it off with a bang with sustainability framework and um, if you're interested in any of our of these webinars do check out our website and uh, register and sign up and for the past webinars as well as the one today uh it's all recorded so the slides, the Q and A's that have been uh, asked and answered, as well as the uh, the recording, will be available on the website. So if you have any questions about our uh, value and value creation, uh, feel free to use the Q and A function to uh, hit us up with questions. My colleagues are on standby to answer them. Uh, for myself, I'm sorry, I can't see the questions because I'm sharing my screen. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, engage with my colleagues throughout the presentation. So. Um, Without further ado, let's begin. So what is value? Before we can tell our value creation story, before we find out how we create value, we need to ask ourselves, what is value and how do we discover it? What does value mean to me? And what does value mean to my company? So through value discovery, we can begin the first step in a journey that will allow us to tell our value creation story. So value is in the eye of the beholder. It is different for everyone. By everyone, I mean stakeholders. So for a customer or a consumer, the value is from the consumption of a product or service. And for a shareholder, value is different. Value could be the expected invested returns and it could be dividends. And for stakeholders like a community, it could be the jobs created by the company for the local community. As a result, value can also be intangible. You know, meaning they are not physical in nature. You can't see or touch them. So things like relationships, brand, trust, goodwill, 
Uh, even intellectual property, like uh, patents, trademarks, and copyrights, these are all in part of intangible value. And as a result, value goes beyond financial returns. It is not just financial in nature. It is not just a numbers game. And my next slide will explain this nicely. Now, increasingly, the role of intangible assets is growing in importance. If we take a look at this chart, we look at the S&P 500 stock index. Since the 1975, you know, over the years, over the course of four decades, the component or market value that is comprised of intangible assets has increased from 17% all the way to 84%. And this is just 2015. We expect it to have grown even more in 2020. So a growing proportion of market value is made up of intangible assets. And this is consistent across several key markets, whether it's Japan, China, Singapore, Malaysia, intangible assets are making up market value. And the US Securities and Exchange Commission or the SEC has also recognized the importance of intangible assets. A quote from Jay Clayton, which is the SEC chairman, basically says that they need to improve their disclosure framework to include recognizing that of intangible assets and not just financials and in particular human capital which is now growing to be a significantly more important driver of value in today's global economy so examples of human capital include talent relationships leadership culture resilience those are examples of human capital and those are growing more and more important in the world we live in today. So on the back of that, in 2019, the SEC proposed rule amendments in uh, risk disclosures with a sharpened focus on human capital. So one of the key proposed changes includes the introduction of human capital resources as a disclosure topic. And with that, they acknowledge that intangible assets are an essential resource for many companies. And when we talk about intangible value, we can't talk about it without mentioning purpose. So what is purpose? Purpose is the reason why your company exists. Purpose is what your company does beyond financial profits. As you can see from this, uh, these two stats, 64% of Americans says that a company's primary purpose should be making the world better and not, it's not about turning a profit. And 41% of Fortune 500 CEOs say that solving social problems should be part of their core business strategy. So clearly, the purpose of a corporation is shifting. It's no longer just about earning profits. It's no longer just about maximizing shareholder value. We are at a turning point and purpose is growing in significance. Take, for example, the business round table. Now, Milton Friedman, a famous economist, he famously said in 1920, uh, 1970 that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. But as I've alluded to in the earlier slide, that view has changed dramatically. Now, in fact, in August last year, the business round table, uh, this is an association of CEOs of huge US companies, the likes of Apple, Ford, Microsoft, they are all on board this business roundtable. They collectively announced a new purpose for them. And this new purpose uh, replaced the one that was first formed in 1997. And that was, they made a renewed commitment to not only focus on shareholders, but also the wider group of stakeholders as well. And they emphasized that maximizing profits is no longer the main focus. So while each individual company of the business roundtable serve their own corporate purpose, they share a fundamental commitment to deliver value to all their stakeholders. And in that day, they have defined five main types of stakeholders that should apply to every company. Number one is customers, who are the ones who support the business by purchasing your products and services. Next, employees who are Basically, the engine of the company, they help drive the business towards its goals. Number three, the suppliers. These are our partners who add value by providing complementary products and services so that the business can run its operations smoothly. 
Number four are the communities in which we work in. These are the people who experience the indirect economical, environmental, social and government, governance impacts as a result of the business activities of the corporation. And of course, last but not least, the shareholders who invest capital in your business and they expect returns from their investment. So these are the five main stakeholders that we need to address when we create, uh, when we, we may tell our value creation story. And uh, it's summed up nicely by Larry Fink, who also, the BlackRock CEO, who also sits on the uh, business round table. Uh, in his words, he said, Pers purpose is not the sole pursuit of profits, but rather the animating force for achieving them. Without a purpose, companies will not be able to generate profits in a sustainable manner. And, and that is what we are seeing in the news today. No doubt, nothing will ever replace the importance of cash. You know, the saying is cash is king, but in, in the world we live in today is increasingly um, not enough to just focus on earning cash, not enough to just focus on turning a profit. You, know, you can see the financial crisis in 2008 and after COVID-19, we are bracing ourselves for an even greater recession than the Great Depression. So cash is not enough during these trying times. And to further emphasize this, uh, I've handpicked three companies to talk about briefly. And these are prime examples of what happens when companies focus too much on short-term profits at all costs. So these are big company names that um, everyone should be familiar with. So the first example, BP. You can see the picture there, smoke rising. You know, there's an explosion. So this is the deep water horizon disaster. Now BP is one of the world's largest oil and gas company. And the deep water horizon uh, was leased by BP to drill oil in the Gulf of Mexico. And in 2010, a disaster struck. The deep water horizon exploded and sunk. Not only did it lead to the deaths of 11 workers, it created the largest marine oil spill in history. You know, uh, at, its, at its worst, an estimated 60,000 barrels of oil was spilled per day and it caused irreparable damage to the environment. And the public trust in the entire petroleum industry was, was shook. And through investigations, uh, BP was found to have placed cost-cutting and short-term profits over uh, sound drilling practices over uh, safety, proper safety measures, and which led to a disaster that could have been avoided. And as a result, they were fined 4.5 billion US dollars. And not only that, uh, as of 2018, uh, the total cost to BP, including fines, penalties, and the cleanup cost, it is estimated to be a whopping 65 billion US dollars. And so because they are focused on short-term profits, you know, disaster struck and they lost so much money in the long term. The next example is Wells Fargo. Now, if you can take a look at the graphic, you know, the customer is being held at gunpoint. Of course, it's not literally. You know, it's the uh, Wells Fargo account fraud scandal. So Wells Fargo is an American bank. They are the world's fourth largest bank by uh, market capitalization. And in 2016, it was discovered that Wells Fargo employees had been creating millions of fake accounts and credit cards without customers' consent. And this has been done over a decade or so, since 2002. And the reason these employees did it were to meet impossible sales goals set by the company. You know, the bank's pressure cooker and toxic work environment were also uncovered. And all this pointed to a complete failure of leadership within the, the bank. And in the aftermath of this scandal, their CEO, their then CEO was fired. Millions of dollars in executive remuneration was clawed back. Billions of dollars were paid in class action lawsuits as well as settlements. And overall, an estimated loss of $220 billion worth of market value was lost by Wells Fargo. So it's a huge chunk of change as well. So you're starting to see a trend you know, in companies that you know, focus on turning a profit in the short term and not focusing on long-term thinking, focusing on the value they can create for their stakeholders. And I end off with the uh, third example. Now, last but not least uh, is the German automotive Volkswagen. 
and the infamous Dieselgate uh, scandal. What happened was in uh, 2015, the uh, US Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA, they discovered that many Volkswagen cars sold in the US contained software that could detect when they were being tested by EPA and they would change the, the performance of the car accordingly to improve results. In, in other words, essentially they were cheating the emissions tests. In actual fact, the engines on these Volkswagen cars, they were emitting pollutants of up to 40 times above what was legally allowed. So it was causing huge damage to the environment. And the reason Volkswagen did this was they had aggressively, they were wanted to hit sales and they were aggressively pushing a diesel cars in the, not only in the US, but around the world. And for them, their biggest selling point was that their diesel cars had low emissions. And Volkswagen, because of this uh, discovery by EPA, they later admitted that over 11 million cars worldwide had this software installed. And what happened was it led, again, it led to down the path of huge fines and great damage to its reputation and trust. And with the total cost to Volkswagen being more than 30 billion euro dollars. So now that we have an inkling of what value is, uh, what it means to different stakeholders, you know, the importance of non-financial value, the importance of intangible assets, and, and the consequences when we only focus on short-term profits, we can begin to explore what it means to create value, hence value creation. Before I start, just a fun picture here. You can see uh, what, what this picture is trying to say is just like value, Value creation is different, different for different people, different for different periods. For example, if you take a look, if you're a warrior, you know, in the ancient times, uh, the value you created was the loot and plunder that you got when you conquered new lands. So that was the value that they created. You know, and uh, when you move down a thousand years later, as a merchant, the value you created uh, were the commodities that you brought along to other lands. And as we progress towards modern times, the value created starts to be uh, different, starts to be bigger, tends to be value in terms of property, in terms of assets. So value creation is different for different people and for different periods. So this is just a more fun way of looking at value creation. Now we look at a more um, scientific and a more serious approach. So according to the International Integrated Reporting Council or the IRC, value creation as defined by them is the process that results in increases, decreases, or transformations of the capitals caused by the organization's business activities and outputs. And this is mentioned within the uh, integrated reporting framework. So on the left, you see uh, the cover. So this was designed by the IRC, and what it does is this, uh, and I encourage you to read this framework if not, what it does is it introduces and recommends an integrated approach to value creation. It brings together concise communication about all the building blocks within the organization, strategy, governance, performance, the business model, um, risks, and how all of this you know, come to communicate and lead to the creation of value uh, in the short, medium, and long term. So if you read the report, you will see this um, graph, what they call the uh, value creation process, uh, it, which is within the IR framework. So it's essentially what this picture represents is you use your capitals or your inputs. So it could be financial, manufactured, intellectual, so on and so forth. You transform them into outputs through your business activities. Through your business activities. Into outputs and uh, outcomes. So this version is a work in, pro in progress. So as you can see, this is from a May 2020 consultation. But the look and feel of it, um, the one that's in the IR framework, it's uh, more or less the same with slight variations. So one of the variations is purpose is now a new addition. So earlier I mentioned about the importance of purpose and purpose beyond profits. So 
the IIRC has recognized that and they are looking to implement it in the latest um, version of the value creation process. Also, they have uh, broken up outcomes into short, medium and long term. And now there's a clearer distinction between outputs and outcomes to indicate these are very different concepts. Because very often people tend to just group outcomes and uh, outputs into the same category, but there's actually a very big difference. So just an example, outputs are what you get immediately after you implement an activity. So if, for example, you're here attending this webinar on value creation, the output to you, hopefully, uh, is you get a clearer understanding about value and value creation. So that is output. Outcomes are usually less immediate. Outcomes are what you start to apply um, when, with what you have learned today about value and value creation. You know, in, in, in other words, it could be how you, then, how you then go on to tell your value creation story. So I encourage everyone to take a look at this uh, the IR framework as well as the latest consultation draft. The, the source is below. You can do a Google. So when we talk about value creation, we also need to talk about value capturing. So not sure if every, anyone has seen this before, but th I found this very interesting framework uh, by two professors uh, in, that worked with the Harvard Law School. So in this, they define value creation. They define value creation as a benefit to the, the stakeholder, to the customer in their example. And value capturing is the generation of enough revenue and profits for the company and the company stakeholders. Sorry, the company shareholders. And they have broken this up into four very interesting categories. They call it nightmare, heaven, dream, and hell. So just an example, uh, in the dream quadrant is where you would find well-established companies typically. So they are high value capturing but low value creation, meaning they are earning substantial profits even though they are, the value creation is limited. So this usually applies to companies with very strong market positions and monopolistic in nature. So the likes of IBM in the 1980s, Kodak in the 1990s, they belong in this quadrant. But then uh, when regulators start showing up, you know, pressure because they were a monopoly, uh, when new competitors appeared offering the same products and services, cheaper, faster, and better, this started to create a pressure on prices and margins. And these, these companies begin to be pushed horizontally to the bottom left, what we call health. So, Initially, you know, companies may be in denial. They will think, oh, we've been successful so long. We are, we are, market share is so large. There's nothing any other company can do to dislodge us from this position. But as they start to move to the left, they begin to get a wake-up call and they realize that they need to do something before it's too late. And usually, they start to introduce stopgap measures, short-term measures that seek to only protect their short-term returns and margins and profits. So things like uh, cutting costs, uh, cross-selling. In the case of Wells Fargo, they started cross-selling, which is one of their main uh, products. And they did it, and, and it led to the uh, Wells Fargo scandal. So cross-selling, and uh, some of them resort to buying up the competitors through uh, mergers and acquisitions. You know, but slowly and surely, because their value creation is so low, they will slide to the left and they'll end up in hell. In companies that cannot survive, they will end up in bankruptcy. So what can companies do when they want to survive this, when they want to get out of hell, so to speak? To do this, they need to focus on creating value. You know? And how can they do that? Usually the best way is through innovation in order to offer better value to their customers. And if they do so, they will slowly begin to rise up and then they will end up in nightmare. So you think value creation, if I have high value creation, shouldn't it be good? Why is it called nightmare? So what the authors have justified was that if all you do is create value for your consumers and customers, but you do not capture the value, you do not keep your enough for yourself in the process, it's a nightmare situation. Basically, you're saying that you work really hard, but you don't get rewarded for it. 
but it is also important to know that value creation is necessary for sustainable performance but then you also need to capture the value okay capturing value means you can turn your value creation you know into a sustainable business and if you are able to do so you can arrive in heaven at last and this is the the sweet spot for companies to be in high value creation and high value capture but companies cannot be complacent if they focus too much on value capturing they they fall into a trap of what is what we call the failure of success you no know, once you're too successful you get blindsided you don't see you get complacent and the law of gravity starts to kick in you no know, companies became become too fixated on optimizing value capture you no know, how much money can they squeeze out of their products how much returns can they uh, promise to their shareholders and then they slowly but surely sink back down to dream and this is where the, the cycle starts again so i have included a link below uh, you can use this framework and then take a look at the paper it's very interesting you can even apply this framework to any industry so if, for example if we use technology as an example um, nokia and blackberry they were in heaven um, when everyone was carrying a nokia or blackberry but when apple came along they almost went straight from heaven down to hell they even skip the the dream part that was how devastating uh, that the industry was and and when apple came in they have more or less hovered around in the, the heaven category and the reason is because they constantly innovating they have always ensured that they could create value and yet at the same time they found the right balance with value capture so in summary what this framework is trying to say uh, is that creating value sustainably is key to creating a uh, capturing value sustainably as well so there needs to be a balance between the two okay. so we've talked about value creation and value capture but we haven't talked about how value can be destroyed you know destructive occurrences like covid-19 can and has destroyed a lot of value I'm sure many of you have read in the news every day, you know, about supply chains being disrupted, global financial markets being affected, countless jobs lost, you know, record-breaking and unemployment rates, reduced spending because of lockdown, consumers are afraid to go out and spend, and uh, investors are holding back their investments because they are afraid that companies may go bust in these uh, tumultuous times. But at the same time. The pandemic has also shown us opportunities to create value you know all around the world and in different sectors and industries you, you see companies they are transforming in order to survive you know and they're hoping that they can survive long enough to turn the corner and start to create and capture value again and then this is a sink or swim moment for many industries and many companies if you can't adapt to a new way of creating value you're going to drown and in the words of plato who is a famous greek philosopher necessity is the mother of invention now in order to survive companies need to understand they need to redefine what is the new normal i'm sure you've heard the phrase new normal mentioned countless times during this pandemic and it's there for a reason you know, to enter this to adapt to and enter this new normal they need to eliminate processes that um create less value they need to eliminate processes that have become redundant and more importantly at the same time they need to innovate and adapt they need to look to invest and find new technologies only then can they not only survive um a, a value destroying event like the covid-19 they can then go on to create and capture that value So in the next few slides we're going to look at some industries some sectors and how some companies within these sectors how they have overcome the challenge of covid-19 how they have overcome the threat of value destruction and how they have created new opportunities and value So one very obvious sector that has been impacted education So most of those of you with kids at home you have experience with home based learning right So as a result of the pandemic um schools have been closed you know students had to resort to online classrooms and online learning and the entire education sector was disrupted 
but um, there arose many opportunities. For example, BYJU, which is a Bangalore-based uh, edutech and online tutoring firm, uh, they are currently the world's most valued edutech firm in the world. So they've been in the online um, tutoring game since a couple of years back. So um, when India was struck with the COVID-19 pandemic and they very quickly announced uh, temporary closures of schools for months, um, BYJ was very quick. They recognized the, the opportunity. Um, they were very quick to announce free access to all its learning programs for all students in India. They offered it as a free service instead of charging them an arm and a leg. And what this has resulted in is a 300% increase in the number of new students they have. And they have not just, they have done more than that. They have also been very quick to upgrade their server infrastructure to cater to the huge amount of students coming back in. They have upgraded their servers to increase the re connection reliability. And they have been quick on their feet to implement new features such as um, live classes, um, introduce new subjects for children to learn, including social studies, geography, history. And they have also been rolling out their, the learning app in multiple languages. So that was BYJU. Another example is over in China, uh, internet giant Tencent. They, they launched their education arm in 2019, uh, just before the pandemic happened. Basically, uh, it's called Tencent Education. And one of, its most, one of Tencent Education's uh, most successful products is the Tencent Class, which basically is a, is a platform, open platform, which allows organizations to offer courses on the platform. So you can imagine um, something like this being very applicable and useful during COVID-19. And in 2019, over 72,000 organizations uh, offered close to 180,000 courses. So it was very successful. And in February, um, during the peak of the lockdown in, in China, the Chinese government instructed students to continue their studies through online platforms, so similar to India. And they announced uh, Tencent Class as one of these available platforms. And what this resulted in was the, uh, the largest online movement in the history of education. I think with approximately 730,000 students from Wuhan using Tencent Class all at the same time to attend classes. So it was uh, unprecedented in terms of numbers. So we've seen how education sector has been disrupted, but how companies have been able to leverage and uh, turn this into opportunities. We then take a look at the banking industry, which has also been hit financially by COVID-19 and virtual banks. So a new breed of banks uh, is coming to town and it's virtual banks. You can take a look at this a diagram. Over just in Asia Pacific, the up and coming, the, the existing virtual banks that are available and up and coming ones, there are many of them. So uh, when it comes to providing financial services to whether it's underserved or developing new digital offerings to an increasingly uh, internet and digital savvy population, uh, many existing banks are struggling to fulfill that need. And hence, that is why the, there's a rise in virtual banks. And so this fits in nicely with the, uh, the current pandemic, you know, with its need for social distancing, with the lockdown and the government's encouragement to use digital services. This has um, in increased the need for more digital banks. And as a result, there has been an, a surge in, in a take up rate of uh, digital services from opening of accounts, digitally, you know, digital transactions, uh, remittance of money, uh, even down to investments uh, using robo advisors and, uh, for financial planning and investment services. So this lockdown period, though it has created great amount of challenges for banks, but companies have been that are able to um, respond quickly and uh, capitalize on these unexpected opportunities can stand to gain from the pandemic. And last but not least, the food and beverage industry one of the hardest hit by the pandemic. You know, the sharp decline 
in customer footfall, you know, the lockdown of, um, of countries, you know, the ban on tourism, this has deeply affected uh, sales in the food and beverage industry. And uh, if you look at this survey by Chok on restaurants in Singapore, um, 93, 93% of restaurants have faced a dip in revenue. It's basically all restaurants have suffered. And 78% are not prepared for the long-term impact of COVID-19. They do not expect to last longer than six months if things do not improve drastically. And 80% have unfortunately um, resorted to cutting staff to reduce costs. And one third of actually asked their full-time staff to take compulsory leave so that they don't have to take no pay leave. But restaurants are also adapting to, in order to stay afloat. You know, many restaurants, you know, include even Michelin star uh, restaurants uh, that you usually associate with dining in for uh, fine dining purposes. They have resorted to online shop fronts. They have resorted to food delivery platforms you know, to, to survive this. We are also seeing collaborations and partnerships across the industry. So for bubble tea fans, I'm sure you know that many of the uh, bubble tea shops, because they couldn't open in Singapore during circuit breaker period, they actually uh, partnered up with other um, F&B partners so that um, when you order the food from these F&B partners, you could also uh, order bubble tea as well. And uh, in Malaysia, um, Nestle even had a collaboration with uh, Starbucks to introduce what they call a Starbucks at home range of coffees that were uh, specially created you know, during the, the pandemic. So there are ways that uh, restaurants, you know, they can, um, they, there are ways that they can think of, you know, in order to, you know, turn this, um, this um, uh, negative events into opportunities. And so it brings me to uh, this burning question. What is the value of value? Okay, we've talked about value discovery and how it then fits into value creation. We have uh, talked about how value creation is important, but you also need to capture your value. And at the same time, value can be destroyed. But just like a phoenix rising from the ashes, when value is destroyed, you can also find value as well. So you're a company that you're, you have discovered what is your value, you have discovered how you create value and how you're going to survive the, the pandemic. But how do you tell this to your stakeholders? What is your story? How do we tell our value creation story to our stakeholders? And I will point you to this piece of research that was done by Black Sun in 2019 together with the IIRC and the Association of uh, International Certified Professional Accountants, uh, AICPA. So what we did was we attempted to answer the question, what is the value of value? You know, through this research, and we, to provide our bots with insights into how businesses are shaping their narrative on value creation. Basically, how, <clears throat> how do you tell your story to your stakeholders? So, and I, these are some very interesting results that I'll be sharing with you. And you can also get a copy of this, um, this research uh, from this link. So some of the uh, results include the future business success relies, uh, executives have found that future business success relies on a broader perspective. In fact, 89% of business leaders and executives they agree that their organizations a need to shift their focus from just pure shareholder value creation to wider value considerations. So this is also in line with what the Business Roundtable has mentioned, that we shouldn't just focus on shareholder uh, value. We should focus on wider value considerations, uh, such as creating value to society. So uh, a, ex a local example of this would be uh, DBS, and they have always been very vocal about promoting financial inclusion uh, by providing financial services to the underserved. So that's one way you can create value for the society. And they also feel that um, it's so important to collaborate, to partner, 
and have co-creation of value through external relation. Excuse me, to external relationships. And an example of this could be um, Swedish uh, furniture uh, manufacturer IKEA. So over the years, they've been working with customers who come up with ideas, product ideas, and uh, to, and they co-design these products and they sell it. And the profit goes to the creators, the, the stakeholders as well. Next, uh, business leader believe business leaders believe long-term thinking cultivates long-term success. In fact, eighty-two percent believe long-term strategic planning would improve value creation potential. So, you need to think far. Okay, they acknowledge that there is a positive link between success and long-term thinking, and they also think that having a future perspective, having that forward-looking, is very important for investors. Investors nowadays are not just fixated on the numbers, on what you can do short term. They are looking at how you can and succeed in the long term. So this clearly indicates a need to shift your focus to a long term strategy that will support sustainable growth. Next, uh, broader value is growing in importance and relevance. Executives uh, have agreed that bringing together um, financial and broader performance information can help them explain how companies create value over time. In fact, 64% rated broader information considerations as extremely important. What this means is they, they felt that the most critical information to communicate was um, how they believe their company will perform. And how they perform is not just in terms of hard measures and metrics on your um, your profit, your revenue, but but intangible things like are we articulating a clear statement of purpose? Like what is our purpose? What is our mission and vision? What are our values? And also what are our sources of competitive advantage? Uh, is our advantage in terms of talent? Is it in terms of resources? Uh, this is something that um, we need to, to talk about in order to talk about broader performance information. And next is considering stakeholder interests, which is uh, central to building trust. Yeah, investors remain a key stakeholder, okay, but the importance of other stakeholders shouldn't be ignored. Again, I, I allude to the business round table where they have uh, identified five stakeholders. The importance of these other stakeholders are also important and like employees and investors. And 77% agree that value creation discussion is most important for employees. What this means is communicating, reaching out and engaging your employees is becoming priority for business leaders. Today's employees want to work for companies with a clear purpose, a beyond financial focus. You know, employees nowadays, they want to make a difference in society. They want to, to do good. And this interest, their interests need to be taken into consideration when making business decisions. If you can let your employees know that their interests have been considered, it goes a long way towards building trust. Next is focusing on value. Now, focusing on value leads to better communication. Having the right focus on value creation can help to drive internal change and it can help to support your external communication to your stakeholders. And overwhelmingly, 99% believe it's important to explain how their organization creates value for the long term through communications. In other words, through corporate reporting. And 51% of business leaders have felt that they are making progress on their reporting journey and hence their value creation story. And over the years, they feel that their corporate reporting is becoming a better form of strategic insight into the company, that they are improving in terms of having a better focus on outcomes for the company and that he has promoted better engagement on how they have created value for their stakeholders and that they are more forward-looking. They are thinking more long-term. And last but not least, 
uh, through integrated reporting, you can achieve integrated thinking. And integrated thinking needs board support to progress further. So most business leaders, they believe integrated report will provide a more cohesive uh, approach to corporate reporting and, and it will help them articulate their value creation story. So how, how, does, how, do, how does integrated reporting do that? Um, they can improve the relevance of important information to key stakeholders. They can enhance accountability for tangible and intangible assets. They can also improve um, they can also help to break down internal silos because to create an integrated report, it requires a partnership between departments to come up with a fully integrated report. And hence, it also helps to reduce short-term thinking. However, as a strategic tool, uh, as useful as it is, it can only be effectively used if they have the full support of the board or executive. You know, a clear tone at the top, buying from the board or your uh, executives, this will then be able to help drive you know, uh, long-term value creation and integrated thinking more effectively within the organization. Now, if your report your is only focused on the numbers you know, on year on year, how are you then going to get them on board the integrated reporting and think long-term? So definitely buying is required from the board. And so with that, um, to help you discover you know, and come up with a value creation stories. Here are 10 questions you can ask yourself. By asking yourself these questions, you will have a clearer picture of what needs to be communicated to your stakeholders so that your value creation story can come up in terms of corporate reporting. So number one, uh, have you explained the state of play? What we mean by this is things like, um, have you provided a management view of the market? Have you talked about the major trends impacting the market, such as COVID-19? that's happening or the US-China trade wars, how is that impacting you? What is your company's response? Also, what is your company's uh, relative positioning um, as compared to its peers and competitors? And, and talk about what this means for the long-term future of your company. So the state of play. Second question is, who are you? You need to let your stakeholders uh, see, know this clearly. Uh, you can do this by expressing again your purpose, your mission, your vision, and this will allow you to clearly communicate you know, what your organization is um, doing and your role in society. What are you, uh, what, value, uh, what value are you creating uh, beyond financial value? A third question is, does your business explain how you can create value? So you need to ensure that your company demonstrates its uh, long-term value creation process again, beyond purely financial returns. And also to go into detail how your company transforms, creates, or even destroys value. Next, uh, what makes your business unique? For this, you would need to highlight sources of a competitive advantage. And it should be competitive advantages that make your organization different, and that makes you unique, that makes you stand out. Five, uh, where is your business going? So for this, you should lay out a, a detailed roadmap showing your short, medium, and long-term um, actions and uh, how this then all time with your strategic goals and um, that is targeted ultimately towards long-term value creation. And the next five questions, number six, how will you get there? To, to showcase this, you need to disclose what are your strategic goals? What are your long-term strategic goals that are tied to uh, value creation? Okay, and that will answer how you will get there. Number seven is, do you measure what gets managed? You need to provide um, metrics and targets, uh, preferably for the medium and long-term. You know, so this is a more forward-looking question. So this, by providing medium and long-term metrics and targets, this will allow you to show your company's ability to um, that you are able to deliver on your strategy and to create long-term value. So things like um, customer satisfaction, you know, take up rate of your products and services, um, and the, the value and brand, the strength of your brand. So this will help you answer question seven. And number eight is what are your challenges? So for this, provide an overview of the risks that is facing your company and the markets you're operating in 
and what are your mitigation plans? What are your 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 plans to, to um overcome this risk and turn them into opportunities? And you should also include sustainability related challenges like uh, environmental, social, and governance ESG issues here. Second last one is action linked to reward. So you need to articulate how remuneration for your executives, for your directors, how this funnel and time to long-term value creation and strategic goals. Are they remunerated fairly, you know, uh, based on the performance that the company, based on the performance of the executive or the board, you know, does. So make a clear link between that and also explain how the board you know, has oversight you know, over culture, over purpose, over values within your organization. And last but not least, have you provided a complete picture of value? You know, explain how you have managed your resource allocation, you know, how you have you know, balanced your capital, your non-capital investments, your financial and non-financial value, your tangible and intangible assets. Give a complete picture. Don't just focus on the financial aspect. Don't just focus on the numbers. You know, marry everything together and paint a picture of how you use them to create a long-term value. So I know I have, I have said a lot about these 10 questions. For more details, as well as the statistics, um, please refer to the report that I have um, referenced earlier on in this slide, uh, in this presentation. So maybe now I will just show you an example of an industry and, and how value creation stories are, can be told you know, in an industry that it seems very similar, but many different stories can come out of it depending on what is your competitive advantage, depending on what value creation means to you. So as you can see from this title, obviously I'm going to talk about the right healing market, which the has to which can be said to have um, experienced many bumpy um, rights along the years, pun intended. So the question we want to ask is there value in the right healing market? And the answer is resounding yes. So the right healing market was valued at 50 billion US dollars in 2018. Now that's a huge sum, you know, but when you compare it to the total addressable opportunity, the total available value within urban mobility, which white hailing is a part of, that market is a worth 7 trillion US dollars, which means that at 50 billion, less than 1% of the market is tapped. So as you can see, there is a lot of value. There is a lot of untapped potential of value remaining or hiding in the right healing market. It is, however, a market that is highly competitive. You know, I'm sure you've used Uber, you've used Grab, you've used Gojek. It, this industry is a very cutthroat one. It encourages a winner-takes-all mentality. And, and the unique aspect of this is because it has limited product differentiation. Custom, uh, companies are basically competing only on two things. Number one is price. How cheap can you get? And waiting times. How long do I have to wait before I get on the car? Get in the car and how long before I get to my destination? And because of this, this often leads to price wars. You know, uh, Uber, Grab, everybody starts cutting prices, offering cheaper prices, promo codes. You know, and this is unsustainable. You know, it only works for a short run and nobody wins except the consumer, of course. And this results in uh, heavy losses. And if you recall the, the heaven, hell, nightmare, heaven, uh, the, the value creation, value capture framework, this, this will effectively place companies in hell, which is the bottom left, if you still remember the framework, which is a uh, low value creation and low value capture, which is not a good place to be in. Also, this is an industry with very low customer loyalty. Okay, um, customers don't have to stick with one app. Usually, what we do is, oh, uh, we if you want to book a a a, a right hailing service from one uh, place to another, we, we check a few, we find the cheapest ones, and if not the the fastest one, and we go with that. So there's very low customer loyalty. You can just switch apps, and for drivers, uh, this low loyalty applies as well. The price wars can lead to cuts in the incentives and commissions earned by drivers. And sometimes this forces drivers to leave the industry altogether or join other companies. 
So there's a lot of turnover rate in terms of the drivers. They even have an industry term for it, it's called driver churn. Because drivers come and go at such a quick rate, it's like it's churning. And the, the cherry on top of this very challenging uh, cake is the constant battle with regulators, the regulatory issues like a license to operate in certain jurisdictions, the constant battles with unions you know, who are trying, trying to protect the uh, livelihoods of our taxi drivers. So uh, a prime example, of course, is Uber. You know, in the news, uh, if you've read it, they have lost their license to operate in London uh, last year. And London is one of Uber's biggest markets. And not only that, this is the second time in two years that Uber has lost the license to operate in London. So they have faced a huge struggle, up huge struggle with regulatory issues. And on top of that, you know, right hailing firms have all felt the devastating impact of COVID-19. A lot of value has been destroyed for them. You know, with lockdowns and more people staying at home, the demand for rights has plummeted. You know, many of the major players have resorted to layoffs to project margins. Gojek, just very recently, I think yesterday, they announced that they were cutting 9% of headcount. Earlier, Grab announced that they were laying off 360 employees. Uber has laid off 3,000 employees. MPD is also laying off uh, uh, a lot of their staff. So, which comes back to my earlier question, is there value in the right healing market? Now this, so of course the answer is yes. Despite the issues and difficulties I've mentioned of being in the right healing market, despite these challenges, I would like to show uh, three companies in the next couple of slides that have still managed to uh, identify future value uh, and are telling their own uh, unique value creation story. So the first one is Uber. You know, the, you know, in Uber's case, the right hailing giant, you know, the one that started it all, they did a major overhaul of their, their apps in September 2019. And previously, they had Uber, uh, Uber X, they had um, Uber Eats, they had many apps, you know, and it was all over the place. And uh, in September 2019, they Follow the footsteps of uh, companies like Gojek and Grab. They merged their apps into a single super app. And they have also been purchasing companies uh, to offer a multitude of services uh, in order to diversify uh, essentially their services offered. So the, the idea for Uber to create this super app is to provide within one single app you know, access to transport, food, groceries, banking services, and more. And uh, in their CEO's uh, Dara Khosra Sahi's own words, they what we want to be is a company that is the operating system for your daily life. So what they're trying to um, tell their value creation story here is a user experience, being the, uh, the super app, the one app that meets all your needs and is the operating system of your life. So that is the path that they have identified in terms of value creation, which is uh, experience. Now, moving closer to, to home to Singapore and Malaysia is uh, Grab. You know, for Grab, their value creation story is about access. And so right before the pandemic, they, they announced that they were going to form an alliance, a partnership with Singtel. Singtel is the largest telco in Singapore and to apply for a virtual bank license. Now, this consortium between Grab and Singtel would allow them to provide a bespoke service experience that will allow them to empower their users to provide access to the unmet and underserved needs of uh, consumers in Singapore and within the region. So this is also supported by a series of products and services that Grab has been releasing uh, over the years, including Grab Pay, Grab Finance, and Grab Insure. So all these apps are trying to make uh, Grab as a service more accessible, more transparent, and uh, more affordable. So for Grab, from this angle, their value creation story is about access. And one more, uh, Titi, who is the, which is the largest uh, ride hailing company in China, and is in the top five uh, firms uh, in terms of size around the world. So their value creation is one of store uh, safety. Um, for those who don't know, uh, in, in 2018, uh, Titi was in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. Uh, safety issues, uh, 
safety lapses in their app had resulted in the deaths of uh, two female passengers at the hands of uh, two drivers within like a span of one or two months. And it created a huge uproar within the community. They faced a lot of criticism. And they were basically accused of the foregoing safety for profits, for growth, uh, a tale that, that should be familiar with you now. So the, the CEO, um, which is shown here, she publicly apologized and they, they announced, you know, basically they admitted that basically they had like uh, their ambitions, their vanity for infinite expansion lead to safety lapses, you know, and resulted in the deaths, unfortunate deaths of uh, two passengers. And from there on, they vowed to prioritize safety as the most important performance indicator and to abandon our skill altogether as a measurement of success. So for them, safety would be the most important KPI. And to back it up more recently, they announced a new three-year strategy in uh, April 2020. And uh, again, safety was a top priority for them. And in their own words, their focus was no longer about you know, um, short-term profits. They were focused on longer-term safety capacity building and therefore user value growth. So here are three very different uh, very similar com companies in terms of offering products and services, but their value creation story is very different. So just like how value is different for everyone, you know, how value creation is different for everyone, the story that you can tell as a company can also be different. And with that, I, I bring to my the last part of my presentation. So um, hopefully now you have a better picture of how to tell your value creation story. Uh, but not just that, you know, to give you a complete picture of not only value creation, you know, there are so many critical components. You know, that's why we have eight components of trust in this uh, uh, series of webinars. Things like culture, trust, stakeholder engagement, sustainability. Um, all these are huge topics and components by themselves and they all come together in what we form the Horizon series. So this is an annual research done by Black Sun, where we identify best practice and emerging trends uh, in corporate communications across various storytelling channels, not only in print via annual reports, but digitally on websites, and even in social media as well. So do take a time to take a look at the Horizon series, which is available on our website. And our latest research is just fresh out of the oven and it revolves around stakeholder engagement, which was a topic that we had talked about previously and we encourage for you to you know um, take a picture of this slide uh, scan the QR code and request a full copy of the, uh, the research from us and in view of this webinar I'm, I'm pulling up some um, statistics and findings from the horizon series uh, of on value creation that we have collected over the years when doing research so here in this question we, we ask if the company's uh, annual report expresses the company's commitment to create value for wider stakeholders. Um, by wider stakeholders, again, we are referring to stakeholders other than shareholders. So um, this could be found in the company's purpose statement, mentioned in the leadership statements, you know, in your corporate governance section. You know, what we are looking for is a statement of commitment. And uh, we're happy to say in both in Singapore and Malaysia, uh, Malaysia especially is uh, very high, 70% and 97% uh, respectively. So companies in Singapore do understand the need to express this commitment to create uh, non-financial value. However, on the other slide, you know, when we zoom in specifically on, then does the business model make a commitment to create wider or shared value? So what we are trying to see here is if companies Know, be it through the business model diagram, be it through their value creation model or process, uh, or through some form of narrative within the report, do they show clearly that the company's business is committed to creating value beyond financial return? So as you can see, the results are uh, not as good as previous. For Singapore, it's 27%. For Malaysia, it's 57%. So this is an area where, you know, companies can work on to improve in terms of telling their value creation story. And, and one last statistic, again, is about the business model. Does the business model include 
value created for wider stakeholders. Okay. So the previous one was, does it make a commitment? But here is, does it show the value created? So what we're trying to see is if business model explains how the company delivers values, a uh, value to its stakeholders beyond financial value. Okay, so what we're looking for here are non-financial outcomes. Um, you know, in terms of human capital, the number of jobs created, the number of training hours, things that are non-financial um, value, where is it in, in the business model? So um, also room for improvement, Singapore is 31% in 2020, and for Malaysia it's uh, 60%. Okay, so this is just a, a sneak peek of the results in, uh, as part of our Horizon series. So if you're interested to find out more, you know, do visit our website and uh, take a look at the reports we have there. So I, I can foresee the next question, um, People ask me then, what are some good examples of uh, companies that, that do well in terms of telling their value creation story, in terms of reporting on value creation? Uh, I won't show you the companies here, but off the top of my head, um, like for example, in Singapore, uh, you can take a look at um, Olam or DBS, or you can take a look at their latest annual report. And whereas in uh, Malaysia, you can take a look at companies like uh, Maybank, and uh, Nestle. Okay, and uh, if you are curious to find out uh, about companies in the beyond this uh, APEC region, uh, you have uh, British Land, who is a real estate player in the uh, UK, and uh, Old Mutual, which is a bank in South Africa. So all these companies have uh, very different but very good approaches in terms of telling their value creation stories. And it's not just in their business models. You know, if you take a look at any report, you can see that that their stories infused throughout the report in their purpose, in their resection, in their long-term strategy, in their sustainability. So uh, I do encourage you to take a look at those reports. And then with that, um, I'm nearing the end of uh, this webinar. So in the past hour, you know, I have hopefully given you an idea of what is value, how do you discover value, and the importance of uh, non-financial value and not to focus on short-term profits. I've also shown the link between value discovery and value creation, and how value creation is different for everyone and how value can be captured and destroyed. And last but not least, how to create, how to report and tell that story, you know, how to bring out your value creation story that is unique to your company. You know. So, Again, we are, I'm from Black Sun and we are a stakeholder communications company. So as you can see, we are here to help you on your value creation storytelling journey. So if you have any um, need, you, know, you can approach us, um, you can write, you drop an email to us, you know, you can, uh, we can engage in conversation and can help you tell your value creation story. So just uh, feel free to drop me a message on email. Uh, on the next page, I'll show you my colleague's um, email and you can uh, also approach him. So my, my colleague is uh, uh, Wen Shu. So if you're interested in, in um, and you need our help to tell your value creation story, please feel free to write to us. And also just to remind you, if you have not registered and signed up for, the next webinar is on 16 July and it, it is on purpose. You can scan the QR code to uh, write, to, to register for this. And if you are interested in any of the offerings um, by Working Capital, please also reach out to Rachel uh, to, to explore how you all can collaborate. And uh, with that, I uh, end my presentation. And I hope you have found it useful. Uh, if you have any questions, um, I will do my best to answer them right now. Uh, are there any questions? Just to let you know that uh, this webinar, again, uh, is recorded. So uh, once we have edited the video, we will be um, uploading it on our website along with the, uh, the deck of slides. 
So the, the, the references and the sources that are being there, you can then uh, take a look for yourself. Actually, there doesn't seem to be any questions. Uh, question from Erica. Are you aware of any trends in uh, value creation stories by industry? That's a good question. I think what I see across industries, the, the most common value creation story is one of uh, innovation innovation or sustainability so these are two main topics that companies try to focus on when telling their value creation story in terms of how different industries approach it um, I mean from my presentation you have seen how the right healing uh, companies have told their value creation stories. Um, so within, uh, even within one industry, there are many different ways to tell your value creation story. But um, off the top of my head, most are uh, coming in from the angle of innovation and or sustainability. Any more questions? If I can chime in, I think some of the uh, uh, good value creation stories generally come after when things have gone wrong. So you find that there's a lot of good stories when things have gone wrong. So, so I think when things go wrong, people discover what needs to be fixed, like what survey mentioned, uh, processes, things that are uh, unproductive, and, and it gives the, the companies the opportunity to put their honesty up front. So I think look at DD when safety was uh, compromised, the best stories are talking about uh, creation of value through safety. So you take what is bad and you turn it into good. That's, that's my experience and that is linked to uh, risk management. So risk management is not just trying to prevent risk, but understanding when they go wrong, how do you take advantage of the risk? Any more questions? Next week's web the, the next webinar on uh, our seven no, our six webinar on uh, on purpose uh, will be interesting because uh, purpose is now required in uh, integrated reporting uh, when the new framework comes out and for those countries uh, especially in Malaysia and for companies who are considering doing it in Indonesia. My purpose will be uh, challenging because uh, the often this used definition of purpose is what is your why, uh, who are you, like what survey say, who are you, and uh, it is very 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 difficult, and people get purpose mixed up with mission and vision. I guess there are no further questions. Everybody's hungry and out for dinner. So uh, I, I guess we will end it off here. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to approach me or my colleagues and we'll do our best to help you tell your value creation story. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you for taking your time to participate in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you.